Mr. Noel Coward. Dance, 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 little lady, youth is fleeting to the rhythm beating in your mind. Dance, 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 little lady, so obsessed with second best, no rest you'll ever find. Time and tide and trouble never, never wait. Let the cauldron bubble, justify your fate. Dance, 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 little lady, dance, 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 little lady, leave tomorrow behind. That recording was made in Las Vegas in the summer of 1955, and it represents Noel Coward at the height of one of his many careers, that of cabaret entertainer. To see Coward whole, wrote Kenneth Tynan once, you have to see him in cabaret, romping fastidiously through the batwing melodies of his youth and remaining constantly and uniquely in high definition. As Noel once said to me, after playing to pre-war cafe society in London, I played equally happily to post-war Nescafe society in Las Vegas. But even so, the Americans' wealth and glamour were geographically and socially a whole world away from the one from which, half a century earlier, Noel himself had emerged. I can remember, I can remember, the months of November and December were filled for me with peculiar joys, so different from those of other boys. For other boys would be counting the days until end of term and holiday times, but I was acting in Christmas plays while they were taken to pantomimes. I didn't envy their Eton suits, their children's dances and Christmas trees. My life had wonderful substitutes for such conventional treats as these. I didn't envy their country larks, their organized games in paneled halls, while they made snowmen in stately parks, I was counting the curtain calls. Coward's childhood, if one had to sum it up in a single phrase, was suburban and the surroundings were apt, as he later recalled, to decline into genteel poverty unless carefully watched. Noel Coward was born in Teddington, Middlesex on December the 16th, 1899. I cannot remember, I cannot remember the house where I was born, but I know it was in Waldegrave Road, Teddington, Middlesex, not far from the border of Surrey. An unpretentious abode, which I believe, economy forced us to leave in rather a hurry. But I can remember my grandmother's Indian shawl, which although exotic to behold, felt cold. Then there was a framed photograph in the hall of my father wearing a Norfolk jacket, holding a bicycle and a tennis racket, and leaning against a wall looking tenacious and distinctly grim, as though he feared they'd be whisked away from him. I can also remember with repulsive clarity appearing at a concert in aid of charity at which I sang not the green hill far away that you know but the one by Guno. I remember a paperweight made of quartz and a sombre Gustave Doré engraving illustrating the book of revelations which I am told upset my vibrations. I remember, too, a most peculiar craving for licorice all sorts. Then there was a song, Oh, That We Two Were Maying, and my uncle, who later took to the bottle, playing, and playing very well, an organ called the Mistel. I remember the smell of rotting leaves in the autumn quietness of suburban roads and seeing the winter river flooding and swirling over the towpath by the lock. I remember my cousin Doris in a party frock with brewery anglaise at the neck and sleeves. 
and being allowed to stir the Christmas pudding on long ago enchanted Christmas Eves. All this took place in Teddington, Middlesex, not far from the Surrey border. But none of these little episodes, none of the things I call to mind, none of the memories I find are in chronological order. Is in chronological order. Already, as Noel told Patrick Garland in a 1969 interview, he was being taken regularly to the theatre. Mother was interested in the theatre, adored it. And Mother used to take me to musical comedies on my birthday treats and things. I never saw a straight play till I'd been on the stage for a year. Gertie Miller was our great love. Quaker girl, uh, all those sort of musical comedies. Which was the first time you ever went to a theatre? Well, the first time I ever went to theatre was to see um, Sinbad the Sailor at Kingston. And I was only about six and very angry because I thought it was all going to take place on Kingston Bridge. <laughs> and as it wasn't, I had to be taken out because I made a scene. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing could pacify. Then the next was the Dairy Maids. I remember being taken to that and a lot of churning went on. <laughs> that was the Grand Theatre Croydon. I had a tremendous thing for the theatre. I can't think why, so I was brought up in, with a lot of music in my family. All the Coward family were very musical. In fact, I had an aunt who was known as the Twickenham Nightingale. In these years, Mrs Coward began to take in lodgers, and musical soirees were held of a refined gentility that Coward was later to recall with a shudder. His childhood was by now cast in the classic theatrical mould. But then... In 1910, something caught his mother's eye. It was an advertisement in the Daily Mail. Small boy required, must be talented and of attractive appearance, to appear as Prince Muscle in Miss Lila Field's production of her new children's play, The Goldfish. Noel's mother wrote off at once, and for his audition, Noel sang a song called Liza Ann, unaccompanied, an achievement he followed with a brisk tap dance, while his mother, in the absence of a pianist, sang. Miss Field then announced that the audition had been successful and that Noel would be engaged for the part at a fee of one guinea per week. There was a terrible pause, at the end of which Mrs Coward murmured sadly that she would not, alas, be able to afford it. Miss Field laughed politely, explained that it was she who would be paying, and Noel Coward had his first professional job. I can remember, I can remember, the months of November and December Although climatically cold and damp, meant more to me than Aladdin's lamp. I see myself, having got a job, walking on wings along the strand, uncertain whether to laugh or sob, and clutching tightly my mother's hand. I never cared who scored the goal, or which side won the silver cup. I never learned to bat or bowl. But I heard the curtain going up. The Goldfish eventually opened in January 1911 at the Little Theatre, and it was the play in which Noel Coward as an actor was born. The Daily Telegraph found him resourceful, and the stage noted a robust appearance, while the Daily Register recorded somewhat surprisingly that all Mayfair flocked to the performance. In a BBC interview with Michael McCohen, Coward himself described what happened to him after The Goldfish. I was engaged by an agent, uh, Barry Winstock, to go down and play a tiny part of a page boy in the last act of a play, and I only got there in time for the dress rehearsal. Okay. And I pushed all the furniture back at home, and my mother rehearsed me. And I came on and electrified Charles Hawtrey, because he'd never <laughs> seen me before. I gave a sort of full-out grand performance, forgetting that I was supposed to be a little page boy. And it delighted Charles Hawtrey? I heard him say to his <coughs> stage manager, after I'd walked off. Tava never let me see that boy again. <laughs> he was wonderful. He came to me afterwards, having relented rather, and said, now listen, I want you to understand something if you're going to be an actor. And that is, though I'm sure you speak, have a very nice speaking voice, but you must remember you're playing a common little boy. And so I think it'd be better if you can play it in a Cockney accent. Do you think you can? And I said, oh yes, I sure I can. And so instead of doing it for these tremendous periods, I gabbled it in Cockney 
And as a reward, he gave me an extra entrance. Ah. <laughs> and then you played with him a lot after that. Then he put me into um, Where the Rainbow Ends, uh, another page boy part, but a better mm. part. He was extremely kind to me as a little boy. I can't think why I drove him mad. He used to say, keep away from me, boy. I was always chattering at him. And uh, he signed an autograph book I had, which had sweet peas on the cover. He cover uh, signed it 17 times. <laughs> until I really gave up. And then I was <laughs> not allowed to be on the stage, because I once made him miss an entrance <laughs> by chattering at him. But apart from his work with Charles Hawtrey, the man whom Coward himself always called the master, he found time to act in such other classic children's plays as Peter Pan. In the spring, Italia Conti wrote to Mrs. Coward, offering Noel three weeks' work with the Liverpool Repertory Company. It was an engagement that led to his meeting with the little girl who was in later life to become his most celebrated and frequent stage partner. Years afterwards, Noel set down his first impressions. I was engaged at a salary of two pounds per week. In due course, I was seen off by mother at Euston, and in company with about ten other children and Miss Conti, travelled to Liverpool. It was a pleasant journey. We ate sandwiches and chocolate and played card games on a travelling rug stretched across our knees. Some of the children I already knew. The others were strangers, with the exception of Harold French and a vivacious child with ringlets to whom I took an instant fancy. She wore a black satin coat and a black velvet military hat with a peak. Her face was far from pretty but tremendously alive. She was very mundane, carried a handbag and a powder puff, and frequently dabbed her generously turned up nose. She confided to me that her name was Gertrude Lawrence, but that I was to call her Gert because everybody did. That she was 14, just over licensing age, that she had been in the Miracle at Olympia, and Fifanella at the Gaiety Manchester. She then gave me an orange and told me a few mildly dirty stories, and I loved her from that time onward. Still too young to be called up into World War I, Noel got into a tour of Charlie's aunt and then was hired by the impresario Robert Courtenage to play opposite his daughter Cicely and a youthful Jack Hulbert in a musical about undergraduate life at Cambridge, which Mr Courtenage had written and entitled The Light Blues. But, as Cicely recalled... He wasn't very, very popular in this particular play because he was very young, very, very young. He used to air his views. And... Uh, we didn't think very much of that, not, not only myself, but the several of us, because he, he thought he was too young to do that, you know. And the, and the thing was that he was right, that was so irritating. After that show, Coward got a job with the pioneer Hollywood film director D.W. Griffith, who was in England to make a propaganda film about the First World War called Hearts of the World. Noel was paid a pound a day for making his face up bright yellow, which the camera then demanded, and for wheeling a barrow up and down a village street in Worcestershire. But the war which that film was about became a reality for Noel a month or two later, when he received a summons to attend an army medical at the Camberwell swimming baths. What happened about my army career was one long series of sad little disasters. First of all, I hated it. B, I hated making my bed out of boards. And having made my bed out of boards, I hated sleeping on them. But then, fortunately really for me, doubling back, when I was doubles in the army, you know, uh, uh, doubling back from a terrible parade, caught my toe in a slat and fell flat on my face and got concussion. And so the next thing I knew was I was in the first London General Hospital with my mother weeping. A little bit overdoing it she was because she knew it wasn't really very serious. But from then onwards that was really I think the end of my army career because I had already got something, I'd had a tubercular gland and so I wasn't viable for foreign service. And so a very, very nice captain sent for me and said, do you think you are going to be of much use in the army? And I said, well, 
frankly, no. And he said, in that case, uh, don't you think it would be a good idea if you were discharged? And I said, it's one of the best ideas I've ever heard. And I was discharged from the army. Safely out of the army, Coward went straight back to the theatre. Towards the end of 1918, he was working in a new Jerome Kern musical, originally entitled Oh Boy, but retitled Oh Joy for London audiences. The part, however, turned out to be simply a walk-on in the chorus, and in something of a half, Noel retreated to the lodging house in Ebury Street. Another near neighbour, then, was the young actress Edith Evans. There was a time when his mother and father and my mother and father had a house next door and we both had lodgers. Ours was called an apartment house. I don't quite know what his was called, it was probably much the same, but it was in Ebury Street. And we had a most delicious gossip, you can imagine, can't you? Because a lot of his other friends wouldn't know that part of his life. And we talked about Ebury Street and everything we did there, and it was very great fun. One of the leading theatrical impresarios at this time was André Charlot, and it was to him that Coward got an introduction from Beatrice Lilly in 1918. At Charlot's request, Noel played his Forbidden Fruit, the first song he had ever composed. Charlot listened politely, bade him farewell, and turned to Miss Lilly. How dare you bring that untalented young man into my office? He plays the piano badly and sings worse. Kindly do not waste my time with people like that ever again. For Coward, the life was now back to that of an out-of-work actor. And then, towards the end of 1919, the American producer Gilbert Miller sent for him. He'd liked one or two of Noel's scripts, and he'd had an idea for a play which he wanted written. Noel, he thought, would be the man to write it. Doubtful about writing a play from somebody else's idea, but hardly in a position to turn work down, Noel completed it in three days. The play was called I'll Leave It To You. It starred Kate Cutler and Noel himself, and it opened in London on the 21st of July, 1920. In fact, the London success of I'll Leave It To You was not as great as even Coward had anticipated. It opened at the New Theatre in June, but closed in July after merely 37 performances. The notices were not bad, but not all that good. Shortly afterwards, Noel was engaged to play in the revival of an Elizabethan comedy, The Night of the Burning Pestle. It was by Mrs. Beaumont and Fletcher, two of the dullest Elizabethan writers ever known. And I had a very, very, very long part. All the way through, I was never on, on one side, off the other, round the back, etc. And I was very, very bad in it. Why must the show go on? The rule is surely not immutable. It, it might be wiser and more suitable just to close. If you are in the throes of personal grief and private woes, why stifle a sob when doing your job when, if you'd use your head, you go out and grab a comfortable cab and go right home to bed because you're not giving us much fun this laugh clown laugh routine's been overdone hats off to show folks for smiling when they're blue but more camille faux folks are sick of smiling through and if you're out cold too old and most of your teeth have gone why must the show go on i sometimes wonder why must the show go on Coward succeeded nonetheless in giving one or two turnable performances and 16 of the company mumps before he retired to bed, there to spend his 21st birthday. But by early in 1921, he'd recovered sufficiently to publish a slim volume of sketches, parodying the current fashion for romantic historical fiction. And he'd also got himself a part in a play called Polly with a Past. With him in that was Edith Evans. Now, this brilliant man I knew, first of all, when he was about 17. We were in a play together, and I don't remember very much about the acting, either his or mine, but we walked home together, and I used to like that, because he talked to me, and he once told me he'd had something published. 
I thought that was terrific. Published, I mean. Grown up and grand. And he had to. And as he wasn't on stage all that much, Noel also found the time to write another play. This one, called The Young Idea, owed more than a little to the influence of George Bernard Shaw in general and his You Never Can Tell in particular. So when it was completed, Noel sent it to Shaw himself. Ten days elapsed and I had the most enchanting letter back with the script. Scrawl all over with No You Don't Young Author and things like that written. And he suggested the second scene of the second act, wrote it out for me. I was 22 years old, and he never heard of me. And then wrote with it a letter saying, never read or see anything of mine again as long as you live. He knew, I think, that I had talent. He was a strange and kindly man. Having got the play back from Shaw, Noel sent it on the usual round of agents' offices. While waiting for a reply, one night he found himself at a dinner party given by Ivan Avello and John Gielgud. At the dinner party, Noel was fascinated by Gene Eagle's talk of Broadway and the American theatre. And soon afterwards, he borrowed the money for his ticket and sailed to America, hoping that New York might offer him the success which London had been so far foolish enough to deny him. But on this first visit to New York in 1921, the city was rather less than bowled over by the presence of Noel Coward. I went to America because I wanted to go to America, which was a good enough reason. And I landed with 10 pounds and no return ticket. In the month of May, when all the theatres closed, uh, I'm the impression that everybody would rush, snap up my plays. Of course, they all went away for their holidays. And so there I lived in a fortunately limp flat in Washington Square. And I lived for six months on really practically nothing. That is the only time in my life that I've ever virtually starved. While he was sitting on a park bench in New York, trying to figure out how to raise the money for his fair home, Noel had written a short story of I'll Leave It To You at the suggestion of a New York publisher, who asked Coward if he would mind turning his own play into this story. For five hundred dollars, said Noel, I would gladly consider turning War and Peace into a vaudeville sketch. Back in London in 1923, Coward found a producer for The Young Idea. It opened at the Savoy on February the 18th, and it had a two-month run. After it closed, Noel went through another thin time, and was forced to borrow £200 from his old friend Lord Latham. Latham happened to be a friend and financial backer of the impresario André Charlo, and Charlo was now persuaded that what he needed were several songs by Noel Coward. These were for a review called London Calling, so named because of the call sign of the then brand new British Broadcasting Company, founded in 1922. Charlot's original intention was that Coward should share the writing, but by creating sketches for which the only suitable music would be his own, Noel managed to author rather more than half of the whole show. His starring appearance was also more his own idea than Charlot's. London Calling, with costumes by Molyneux and special dance routines by Fred Astaire, opened at the Duke of York's in September 1923. A resigned Charlot was later to write, Review is the best medium in which to develop theatrical talent. So many elements are necessary to build up a successful review that it has many times been the stepping stone for an author with one sketch or with one lyric, for a composer with one tune, for a designer with one setting or costume, for an artist with the successful understudy of one item. Your first problem is to decide whether or not to entrust the task of writing the book, lyrics, music to one, two, or more authors and composers. There is only one man who can do the whole thing single-handed and produce the show as well. His name is Noel Coward. 
London Calling lasted all of 316 performances, and for nearly every one of them, Gertrude Lawrence sang the song that would become Coward's first real popular success, the first he ever wrote for her. Parisian hero, society's hero, the lord of the day, the rude of day, is under your sway. But six months into the run, Noel decided to leave for another break in America. Then, back in London in mid-1924, he had one rather special play on the typewriter. Based on a chance encounter in a nightclub, in which Noel had noticed a young guards officer being visibly embarrassed by his mother's determination to be young enough to be the man's sister, Noel had begun to write the play that would make his name once and for all. It was called The Vortex, and it's John Gielgud who here takes up the story. Norman MacDermott, who ran the Everyman Theatre in Hampstead, a very small auditorium holding about a hundred people with no balconies, was willing to put on the vortex, but had not the money to stage it. And Noel was lucky enough to borrow 200 pounds from Michael Arlen, whose new book, The Green Hat, lately to be adapted both for the stage and screen, was a best-selling success that year in London. So the vortex went into rehearsal. Noel and Kate Cutler, his great friend, were to play the two leading parts. But a few days before the opening, Miss Cutler resigned from the cast on the grounds that her part was less good than Noel's and unsympathetic into the bargain. In despair, Noel appealed to Lillian Braithwaite, and she stepped in at the last moment and made an enormous personal success, playing a shallow, vicious mother, after years of being typed as a respectable conventional hostess pouring out tea in Edwardian comedies. The play opened on Noel's 25th birthday, December the 16th, 1924, and took the town by storm. Moved from the Everyman after a few weeks, it played for more than a year, first at the Royalty Theatre and finally at the Little Theatre in the Adelphi, both theatres vanishing after the Second War. From that night when the curtain rose in Hampstead, Noel was never to know poverty again. He was to know everyone, and everyone wanted to know him. Joyce Carey, Lillian Braithwaite's daughter, well, I was playing in something and couldn't go to the first night of the Vortex, so they let me go to a dress rehearsal. And it's one of the most thrilling theatrical experiences I've ever had in my life. George Bishop of the Telegraph and I were the only two people in the theatre, so there was no question of audience reaction or anything. And it was so thrilling. It's the only time I've ever known for sure that something was going to be a success. And the reviews were ecstatic. There was now a general feeling that the playboy of the West End world had fulfilled his early promise with a solid, important play, albeit that now, 75 years later, it may inevitably seem rather dated. I don't ever want to see you again. You're insane. You said wicked, wicked things to me. You've talked to me as though I were a woman off the streets. I can't bear any more. I can't bear any more. Mother, I have a slight confession to make. Confession? Look, here. What is it? Don't you know? <sighs> oh, Nicky, it isn't. You haven't been... Why do you look so shocked? Oh, my God. <sighs> what does it matter? Oh, Nicky. Nicky, promise me. I promise you'll never take it again. <laughs> never in your life. It's frightful. <laughs> Horrible. It's only just the beginning. Oh, what can I say to you? What can I say to you? Nothing under the circumstances. It can't possibly matter now. Hatcher! 
But it's the finish of everything. You're young, you're just starting on your life. You must stop. You must swear never to take it again. Swear to me on your oath, Nicky. I'll help you, I'll help you. you. How oh. could you possibly help me? Nicky. Oh, shut up, shut Nicky. up, don't touch Nicky. me. I'm trying to control myself, but you won't let me. You're an awfully rotten woman, really. Nicky, stop, please stop. go of me. Nicky. Now then, Nicky. now then, you're not to have any more lovers. You're not going to be beautiful and successful ever again. You're going to be my mother for once. It's about time I had one to help me before I go oh, over the edge altogether. Nicky. But although many critics were keen about the Vortex in 1924, the public generally was a little less certain. They went to it, but often emerged somewhat shocked by its references to drug-taking at a time when alcoholism was still not being mentioned in polite society. But as an observer of Coward at this time, it's again John Gielgud who puts the Vortex in perspective. The new avant-garde theatre has been inclined to destroy obvious construction and the climax and the, of what the public used to think was necessary for a good curtain, uh, a situation, suspense, and so on. And Noel, who was a great modern avant-garde writer when he first came out in 1924, when I understudied him in The Vortex, in a way we're almost contemporaries, was then considered very uh, outrageous because for the first time people didn't take bows after every act in his plays, and uh, they had themes of dope-taking and drunkenness and all sorts of things that were considered very disreputable. But he was also the great uh, representative of cafe society, as we now know, know it to be called. Led by Edward VIII, the Duke of Windsor, uh, the whole of society suddenly became aware of the bright young people, who were most of them hard-working actors and society people who got together and had a great deal of fun in the 20s and drove about in fast cars and had treasure hunts and gave parties and dressed up. And there was an enormous reaction from the 1914 war, which, which had left London very dreary and sad and tired, just as the Second War did. And just as in the uh, 1945 there was a great uh, burst of uh, colour and uh, gaiety in London, uh, as a reaction. So in the twenties the same thing happened and the theatre flourished tremendously and Noel was the great avant-garde shock boy of London at that time. Dance, dance, dance to the lady Youth is beating to the rhythm Beating in your mind Dance, dance, dance to the lady So obsessed with second best No rest you'll ever find Time and tide and trouble, never, never wait. Let the cauldron bubble, justify your fate. Dance, 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 little lady, dance, 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 little lady. Leave tomorrow behind. Coward was now clearly all set for a run of success. Soon after the first night of the Vortex, he began to work on another review, this time not for Charlot, but for Charles B. Cochrane, the impresario who was to be responsible for all the Coward shows over the next decade. <laughs> On with the Dance starred Alice Delicia, Douglas Bing, and Hermione Baddeley. By the June of 1925, Coward had On With The Dance running in the West End. He himself was still playing in the Vortex, and for good measure had both Hay Fever and another early script, Fallen Angels, staged in London to capitalize on this Coward boom. Fallen Angels, like the Vortex, had also brought him accusations of depravity, largely because it included scenes in which two women actually smoked and drank on stage, matters not being helped by the fact that one of them was being played by the scandalous Miss Tallulah Bankhead. But once Coward had achieved the quadruple London triumph, he decided for the third time in nearly as many years to try to conquer Broadway. Any little fish can swim, any little bird can fly, any little dog or any little cat can do a bit of this, just a bit of that. Any little hawk can neigh, and any little cow can moo, but I can't do anything at all but just love you. Any little cock can crow, 
Any little fox can run. Any little crab on any little shore can have a little dab and then a little more. Any little owl can hoot to wit to woo and any little dove can coo. But I can't do anything at all but I love you. Across the brink, you've chained me and bound me. No escape now. Where's the grape now? When is the funeral going to be? Whenever I stop to think, see nature all round me. Then I see how stupidly monogamous I am. A lion in the circumstances wouldn't give a damn. For if there were no lioness, he'd lie down with a lamb. Why not me? Any little bug can bite. Any little bee can buzz. Any little snail on any little oak can feel a little frail and have a little joke. Any little frog can jump like any little kangaroo. But I can't do anything at all but just love you. Any little duck can quack. Any little worm can crawl. Any little mole can frolic in the sun and make a little hole and have a little fun. Any little snake can hiss in any little local zoo. But I can't do anything at all, but just love you. On Broadway, The Vortex established Coward's reputation overnight. It ran throughout the winter of 1925-6 to six and was soon joined by Hay Fever, though that did rather less well on the other side of the Atlantic, prompting one wit to write, If Noel Coward is the white hope of the English theatre, may God help it. That winter, the Charlotte Review was again on Broadway, bringing such friends as Beatrice Lilly, Gertrude Lawrence, and Jack Buchanan. It was also the time when Noel got to know such other composers as Richard Rogers and George Gershwin. Back in England, Coward now wrote and staged a play of his called Easy Virtue, and that title alone was enough to bring down on him the full wrath of the official censor of plays, the Lord Chamberlain. For Noel, it was now clearly time to get back to the stage in person, and the director, Basil Dean, gave him that chance. The play was Margaret Kennedy's The Constant Nymph. His co-star was Edna Best, but Noel himself was less than happy with this one. Well, I wasn't happy in that, really, for extremely trivial reasons. Uh, Basil Dean was an excellent director, very meticulous, and of course, I was young and I'd had a lot of success and he wanted perfectly rightly to rob me of Noel Coward mannerisms. I was not allowed to smoke a cigarette because I would smoke it like Noel Coward smoked it. And he made me grow my hair very long and I don't like long hair. And then he made me smoke a pipe. So every time I lit the pipe, it set fire to my hair and we had <laughs> a lot of burning went on. Added to which, it was an extremely difficult part. Because I had to express in the first few minutes of the play that I was a musical genius. Well, I had some very charming music to, to play on the piano by Eugene Goossens, which was lovely, but didn't absolutely establish me as Paderewski, you know. No. Added to which, technically, the play was constructed so that I had a series of ghastly 30-second changes. Oh. I was in tails, in ordinary clothes, back to tails. Back. So when I wasn't actually on the stage, which I was most of the play, I was gasping away at the sides, putting on the shoes and everything. Mm. And then the only really emotional part came at the very end of the play, when uh, Tessa mm. gloriously played by Edna Best. Reached, if you remember, she reached for the window and had a heart attack and I used to lift her onto the bed, gasping rather, she was quite heavy. And then <laughs> the last line of the play was so touching, I used to say, fling up the window and say, Tessa's got away, she's safe, she's dead. Tears, curtain. Unfortunately, on the third performance, the window cord broke. So the window came down onto my hands. And so what I said was, Tessa's got away, she's safe, she's out. Wow. <laughs> Whereupon the dead Tessa looked up like that, and of course the curtain yes. fell in roars of laughter. <laughs> But
But Noel was only to play the constant nymph for a month. Then, one matinee, about a week before he was due to be replaced in the cast by John Gielgud, something in Coward snapped, and he played the whole performance in floods of uncontrollable tears. A doctor diagnosed severe mental and physical strain, and ordered him to bed for a week. All the tension of the past two years, which Noel had suppressed by dint of continuous work, had overtaken him at last, and the only answer was total escape. He went first to New York, but what was happening to Coward was quite simply a nervous breakdown, and to get over it, he travelled to Hawaii, where he recovered sufficiently to write one of his most enduring songs, A Room With A View. A room with a view and you And no one to worry us, no one to hurry us through This dream we found We'll gaze at the sky and try To guess what it's all about Then we will figure out why the world is round. We'll be as happy and contented as birds upon a tree, high above the mountains and sea. We'll build and we'll coo, and sorrow will never come. Or will it ever come true? A room with a view. Coward returned to London with The Marquise, a play he'd written for that grand dame of the 1920s, Murray Tempest. And having written it, surely it was only logical that he should also direct. Murray Tempest was a great comedian and a I absolutely loved her. She was one. I was very nervous at the age of 25 showing Miss Mary Tempest how to act. Mm -hmm. And quite early on in rehearsal, she called me up on the stage and said, Come up here, boy. You wrote this scene and know how to play it. I didn't write it and don't. Ah. And to my horror, I found myself saying, Well, I think you should lift the cup when you say that. Said, quite right, boy. Thank you very much. <laughs> and from then onwards, all was well. And of course, she was, she gave a twinkling, comedic, uh, comment performance. The Marquise ran on Murray Tempest's reputation and did coward himself neither lasting good nor lasting harm as a dramatist. 1927, though, was going to be not just a bad year for Coward, but arguably the worst he'd ever had. In the view of a good many critics, he'd been riding for a fall for quite some time, simply because the sheer volume of his output was bound to mean that some of the scripts and some of the lyrics were just not as good as they should have been. It was St. John Irvin who best explained the situation. He writes good theatre. His plays click, his big scenes uh, come off. But a dramatist cannot live on technique. He certainly cannot live on tricks. Mr. Coward is now at a turning point in his career. There is evidence in his work of sincerity, but one feels that it's in him rather than in his plays. Behind the flippancy and the ignorance of Mr. Coward, there is a fine, flexible and sensitive mind questing for truth. Three months later, a comedy called Home Chat opened at the Duke of York's. The first of two disasters that Coward was to undergo in successive months. The other one was to receive even worse notices. Called Sirocco, it starred Ivan Novello and Francis Doble under the direction of Basil Dean. For the time being, at any rate, Coward did not have his sights set on another play. Instead, he went back to review, a form which had always held a special place in his affections ever since on with the dance. What he now planned, again in collaboration with the impresario Charles B. Cochrane, was a lavish review for the London Pavilion. Its title was This Year of Grace, and above that title was Jesse Matthews. It was a very happy company. We were, all, we were all very happy together. It was a very happy show. This year of grace retrieved for Coward the reputation he'd lost so abruptly with the failure of Sirocco only six months earlier. But looking back, what memories did Jesse Matthews have of Coward as a man? He was a very brilliant, really brilliant young man. A great, great gift. Um, a perfectionist taskmaster. I think he, he was capable of a, a lot of love, 
which he, he was unable to show. I don't think Noel ever really showed only to a few people his real feelings. I think he, in his work, his work had so much love in his work that the love must have been in the man. But the man wasn't capable, at least I never saw, saw Noel express the love that he had in his work. As a person, it never came out. We move on now to one of Coward's greatest successes, Bittersweet, a show that only had its first major revival more than 50 years after the first production. The idea was born in the early summer of 1928, he recalled later. Gladys Coulthrop and I were staying with Ronnie Peake, her family solicitor in Surrey, and an hour or two before we were due to leave, Mrs Peake happened to play to us on the gramophone a new German orchestral recording of Die Fledermaus. Immediately, a confused picture came into my mind, uniforms, bustles, chandeliers and gaslit cafes. There had been little or no musical sentiment on the London stage for far too long, and it seemed high time for a little romantic renaissance. Soon, a few of the very first melodies began to form in my head. My first choice for Sarah had been Gertie Lawrence, but when the score was almost done, she and I realised that her voice, although light and charming, was not strong enough to carry such a heavy singing role. She naturally was disappointed, and I promised that the next play I wrote would be especially for her. In the meantime, a leading lady had to be found for Bittersweet, and the obvious choice was Evelyn Lay. But for reasons best known to myself, I decided to turn it down. Noel was absolutely flabbergasted at the time, and so was I, afterwards. Not many people do get a second chance, but I did get one, and Bittersweet is very, very dear to me. The critics on the opening night in London mightn't have cared for it, but the public adored it. Now, this is just another example of Noel's extraordinary sense of knowing what the public wanted when they wanted it. Bittersweet covers such an incredible range in time and in its music. It starts in the home of Lady Shane in 1929 in the Jazz Age. The Marchioness of Shane is a very old lady, and at the start of the play, two of her young guests, who are engaged to be married, have quarrelled. And Lady Shane has a great desire to set things right between them. She comes into the drawing room and discovers the girl, Dolly, and the pianist, who has been hired to play at the party, declaring their love for each other. Dolly, she says, I come on an errand of peace from your fiancé. I hope the moment is not inopportune. If it is, I apologise. Oh, Lady Shane. You're the piano player in the band, aren't you? I'm the leader of the band. That's a pity. It's not a very good band. Lady Shane. I love Vincent, and, and he loves me. And this is Vincent? Yes, of course. Uh, Vincent Howard. Are you sure he loves you? Would he live for you, die for you? Oh, come, your ladyship, is that necessary? Yes, absolutely. Are you a married man? Uh, no, of course not. Well, you needn't be so vehement. I merely thought you might have forgotten. Are you angry? Not in the least, my dear. What do you intend to do? Oh, I don't know. Well, if I were you, I should make up my mind. You are angry. I detest indecision. I don't understand. Here he is. Vincent, what's happened to the band? Oh, Mr. Howard, please play something. Yes, play something romantic. Yes. I want to dance. Oh, Mr. Howard, play something romantic. I'll play anything anybody wants. That's what I'm hired for. Here's romance for you. How's this? Oh, <laughs> It's hideous. You none of you know anything or want anything beyond noise and speed. What do you mean? What do you mean? Your dreams of romance are nightmares. Your conception of life grotesque. Come with me, you I'll show you. Listen. Listen. Now, here's one of Bittersweet's greatest songs. And here is Peggy Wood as Sarah and Metaxa as Carl. I'll see you again whenever spring breaks again I may lie heavy between but what has been is 
fast forgetting. Sweet memory across the years will come to me. The memories of life in my heart will ever lie. Just the echo. Fancy turning that wonderful opportunity down. You see, parts like Sarah don't grow on trees. And in this part, there was every conceivable emotion you wanted to play. You started off as an old lady of 70, then you became 18, and then you aged to about 30. And then you played, I suppose, about 50, and then you went back to the old lady of 70 again. Now, that's quite a part, isn't it? When that matinee was over, I couldn't resist it. I ran to a telephone and spoke to Elsie April, who was Charles B. Cochran's right hand, well, musically, I suppose, and was also an enormous friend of Noel's. I said to Elsie, do you think there would be any chance of my playing this marvellous role in New York? She said, I don't know. I'll have to ring you back. I got it. As I say, not many people do get a second chance, but I got one. It's incredible to think that that marvellous song of Noel's I'll See You Again was written in a taxi cab. It was written on the corner of Broadway and 7th Avenue in a traffic jam. One of the things I haven't said is how much I appreciated Noel's direction in this play. It was crisp. It was sharp. It had great discipline. And all the characters down to the smallest had their own identities. I often ask myself how much Noel's extreme youth had an effect on him. When he was young, he was taken by his mother to see Gilbert and Sullivan time and again. I think he must have been fascinated by the quartets and the sextets they wrote. I think in consequence, he used to like to use these forms in his own plays. He did it very often and did it very successfully. Where roles are concerned, I think God's gift to a part is one that's well written and comes at the end of a play. If you're half an actor, you simply can't fail. In among all these marvellous characters in Bittersweet, Lord Shane, who appears in the last act, is one of the most enchanting. I found the scene that we played together very endearing. My dear, I want to talk to you. I know. Has your piano been tuned for me? I don't trust your English pianos. <laughs> You can guess what I'm going to say. Yes, I think so. I love you. I was right. Will you honor me by becoming my wife? You've now refused me in practically every capital in Europe. London is the last on the list. Why should London prove the exception? It's home. Yes, I suppose it is. It has charm, London. A very peaceful charm. Particularly for anyone who is tired, like you. You can drive in the park in the spring and look at the crocuses. Please, don't talk of spring. Oh, then there's the autumn when the leaves fall in the square. And you can sit on a rickety iron chair and watch the children picking up horse chestnuts. Whose children? Just anybody's. Fogs come in November. Oh, fogs can be delightful. Can they? Particularly when you're warm and snug by a crackly fire drinking tea, while from the yellow gloom outside, the trees look in at you like ghosts. I don't like tea or ghosts. You're very hard to please. 
By the winter of 1929, Bittersweet was established as a smash hit on both sides of the Atlantic. For the rest of my life, Noel was to write, I was plagued by reporters asking me why I had never managed to repeat its success. Perhaps I never really tried. But for the time being, success was nothing if not flattering. Accompanied by his lifelong friend, Geoffrey Amherst, Noel now set sail on a journey that was to last six months and take him halfway around the world. While in Shanghai, Coward remembered the promise he'd made to his old friend Gertrude Lawrence that he would write a new play specially for her. I'd always wanted to play a right play for Gertie. Her contract with Charlotte was up. And so she sent me a telegram saying, contract Charlotte up, what about it or something. And I wrote Private Lives. And in Shanghai, in the Cathay Hotel, very quickly, and dusted it back, and um, had a telegram back saying, red script, nothing wrong that can't be fixed. So I went back, the only thing going to be fixed is your performance. At this time on his world travels, Noel was also at the height of his powers as a songwriter with Mad Dogs and Englishmen. As he wrote later, the idea of it, and the rhythm of it, got into my head in 1929, when I was driving from Hanoi to Saigon. This drive took about a week, and while jungles and rivers and mountains were unrolling by the window of the car, I wrestled in my mind with the complicated rhymes and rhythms of the song, until finally it was complete without even the aid of a pencil or paper. Tropical clouds were certain times of day when all the citizens retire to tear their clothes off and perspire. It's one of those rules that the greatest fools obey because the sun is far too sultry and one must avoid its ultraviolet ray. Papalaka, 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 boo, that's natives. The natives grieve when the white men leave their huts because they're obviously definitely nuts. Mad dogs and Englishmen go out in the midday sun, the Japanese don't care to. Chinese wouldn't dare to. Hindus and Argentines sleep firmly from 12 to 1, but Englishmen detest a siesta. In the Philippines, they have lovely screens to protect you from the glare. In the Malay states, there are hats like plates, which the Britishers won't wear. At 12 noon, the natives swoon and no further work is done. But mad dogs and Englishmen go out in the midday sun. Oh, it's such a surprise to the Eastern eyes to see that though the English are effete, they're quite impervious to heat. When the white man rides over a native hides in glee, because the simple creatures hope he will impale his solar topi on the tree. Heaven and heaven and heaven and hearts the same natives pay no attention. It seems to shame when the English claim the earth that they give rise to such hilarity and mirth. <laughs> Oh dear man, dogs and Englishmen go out to the midday sun. The smallest melee rabbit deplores this foolish habit in Hong Kong. They strike a gong and fire of an noonday gun to reprimand each inmate who's in late. In a jungle town where the sun beats down to the rage of man and beast, the English guard with the English side merely gets a bit more creased. In Bangkok at 12 o'clock they foam at the mouth and run. But mad dogs and Englishmen go out to the midday sun. Mad dogs and Englishmen go out to the midday sun. The toughest Burmese bandit can never understand it. In Rangoon, the heat of noon is just what the natives shun. They put their scotch or ride down and lie down. In the mangrove swamps where the python romps, there is peace from 12 till 2. Even caribous lie around and snooze, and there's nothing else to do. In Bengal, to move at all is seldom, if ever, done. But mad dogs and Englishmen go out in the midday, 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 sun. In the summer of 1930, Noel and Gertie went into rehearsal under Noel's own direction for Private Lives. Gertrude Lawrence, at her best, and with me, she was usually at her best, was the most brilliant comedian to play with. She was so swift, and her eyes were so true. And it was an enchantment to work with her. I find it very difficult, even now, to listen to her voice. 
without wanting to cry. What are you doing here? I'm on my honeymoon. Very interesting. So am I. I hope you're enjoying it. It, it hasn't started yet. Neither is mine. Are you happy? Perfectly. Good. Are you? Ecstatically. What she like? Hair. Very pretty. Plays the piano beautifully. Very comfortable. How's yours? I'd rather not discuss it. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. He'll probably come popping out in a minute and I shall see for myself. Have you known her long? About four months. We met on a house party in Norfolk. Very flat, Norfolk. There's no need to be unpleasant. But there was no reflection on her unless, of course, she made it flatter. Your voice takes on an acid quality every time you mention her. I swear I'll never mention her again. Good. Now keep off yours. Thank you. Not at all. That orchestra seems to have a remarkably small repertoire. Strange how potent cheap music is. Someday I'll find you Moonlight behind you True to the dream I am dreaming As I draw near you smile, a little smile, for a little while, we shall stand hand in hand, I'll leave you never, love you forever, all of our sorrow Try to make it true. Say you need me too. Someday I'll find you again. You always had a sweet voice, Amanda. Thank you. What exactly were you remembering at that moment? Lots of things. So was I. What fools we were to ruin it all. What utter, utter fools. We were so ridiculously over in love. Yes. And yet, here we are starting off with two quite different people. In love all over again, aren't we? Aren't we? No. Elliot. We're not in love all over again, and you know it. Good night, Amanda. Oh, Elliot, don't leave me. We won't talk about ourselves anymore. Talk about outside things, anything. Only stay with me till I pull myself together. Very well. What have you been doing lately, during these last years? I, I went around the world, you know, after... Yes, yes, of course I know. How was it? The world? Yes. Very enjoyable. China must be very interesting. Very big, China. And Japan? Very small. Did you eat shark's fins and take your shoes off and use chopsticks and everything? Practically everything. And India, the burning gars or ghats or whatever they are, and the Taj Mahal. How was the Taj Mahal? Unbelievable. A sort of dream. That was the moonlight, I expect. Of course, you saw it in the moonlight. Yes. Moonlight can be cruelly deceptive. And it didn't look like a biscuit box, did it? You know, I've, I've always felt that it might. Darling, I do love you so. I do hope you met a sacred elephant. They're lint white, I believe, it's very, very sweet. I've never loved anybody else for an instant. <laughs> and you love me too, don't you? There isn't any doubt about it anywhere, is there? No. No doubt anywhere. You're looking very lovely in this damned moonlight, Amanda. Your skin is clear and cool and your eyes are shining. And you're growing lovelier and lovelier every second as I look at you. You don't hold any mystery for me, darling. Do you mind? There isn't a particle of you that I don't know, remember, and want. I'm glad, my sweet. More than any desire in the world, deep down in my deepest heart, I want you back again. Please. Don't. Don't say any more. You're making me cry so dreadfully. You see her use of voice. Yeah. Her use of voice, which was instinctive. Mm. Gertie was not a thinking reed. 
but her talent gave it all to her. She was the most intuitive, accurate. When she did not occasionally go overboard, which she was inclined to do, but when she was on the beam, as you hear her, and that, incidentally, when this record was done, we did it in an hour, and we were opening that night at South Seas before we play open in London. And when they sent the test to us on Wednesday, I hated me in it and thought she was wonderful and she hated her and we really were quite serious we didn't want it to be put out yes. and it turned out to be a very successful record now you see there was adrian allen laurence olivier gertrude laurence and me and larry uh, had never uh, i hit him on the head to make him play it because it really isn't a very good part victor but i wanted not to have him cast as an ordinary uh, ha 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 stuffed shirt because I don't think Amanda would ever have married. I said I must have somebody who's physically very attractive otherwise Amanda would never have married him. He must have something to give. He hasn't got much in the dialogue way and poor Larry never really enjoyed, enjoyed acting it with me. We had great fun but it really curiously enough did him a lot of good. I think Noel probably was the first man who took hold of me and made me think. He made me use my silly little brain. He taxed me with his sharpness and shrewdness and his brilliance and his brain and with a point out when I was talking nonsense, which nobody else has ever done before, would make me, give me a sense of the balance of right and wrong. In the years since Private Lives was first staged, there have been many, many revivals. One of the most notable starred Maggie Smith and her then husband, Robert Stevens. I thought the play, and I still think the play, is flawless. It's perfect. It's a perfect piece of writing. But I was a little worried that it wasn't quite my cup of tea, as I'd never, ever played a leading part in that kind of high comedy. But on the first night, we were called down into the wings, and Noel was going to be there the first night, which was very nerve-wracking. And he was sitting in the box on stage level, so you could see him all the time. At least I could. <laughs> But I was standing in the wings waiting, and suddenly I heard applause and cheering outside the theatre, in the foyer. And that came into the auditorium, and the audience obviously stood and applauded and cheered him as he sat in his box. Which, of course, is terrifying if you're about to go on and play his part in his play, and probably the, the part he's most associated with. And I thought, nuts, this is no good at all. If the play needs Noel Coward to make it work, it's no good. And I don't think it does. But what was interesting was, when we were playing it, on every one of his laugh lines, like, um, don't quibble, Sybil, or whatever, the audience would look at him to see if he was laughing before they laughed. It was most odd. No, I said afterwards, because we had a party afterwards, naturally, and I said, now, come on, tell me. Just tell me, give me your notes, because he'd seen none of the rehearsals or anything. And he was very pleased and very satisfied and most charming and flattering. But he said, the play works quite differently now. He said, because you must remember, when we played it, the audience was full of Victorians, people who were born in the period of Victoria. And they came not to laugh, but to be shocked. And they were genuinely shocked with all the jokes about divorce and religion and the Catholics and everything. He said, but now, of course, that's not important. And he said, the laughs come in different places. And he said, you also get many more laughs than we got in the original production. Which I thought was most curious. As usual, at first, nobody liked private lives except the public, and they filled the new Phoenix Theatre for three months, at the end of which time Noel and Gertie, as was their custom, whipped the play off and went straight to Broadway, where it was to repeat its triumph. But throughout the latter half of the run there, Coward's mind was on something very different. He had decided, with the encouragement of Charles Cochrane, to see if he could write a play big enough to fill the entire stage and orchestra pit of the Theatre Royal Drury Lane. 
he happened upon some old bound volumes of the Illustrated London News. And in one of these, he found a full page picture which was to trigger in his mind the idea for an epic production which would be a panorama of 30 years of English history from the year of his birth, 1899, up to the present, seen through the eyes of Jane and Robert Marriott and their family and friends and servants. It was, in fact, to be a cavalcade. And the picture which started the whole thing off in Noel's mind was one that showed a troop ship sailing for the Boer War. I think I'd better be getting aboard. It's come at last, hasn't it? This moment. You'll be very brave, won't you? Take care of yourself, my dearest. I should probably be seasick. Lie down flat on every possible occasion. I'll try to remember. You mustn't worry about me being unhappy when you've gone. I'm going to keep myself very busy. Lady Brandon is organizing an enormous relief fund matinee in February. She's asked me to help her. And there'll be lots of other things too. I shan't give myself time to feel anything except just very proud. I'll write and telegraph whenever it's possible. Oh, this is horrid, isn't it? I really must go. Not just for a minute. I'm going to kiss you once more now. And then I want you to turn away and go on talking so that you won't see me actually leave you. Very well, my darling. Edward and Joe were terribly anxious to come too, but I'm glad I didn't bring them, really. Joe gets overexcited so easily and he's had a very bad cold anyhow. Edward could have come, I suppose, really, but that would have upset Joe so dreadfully being left alone. Take care of yourself, my own dear. You're not here anymore, so I can break down a little. I felt you go when I said about Joe being overexact. Robert. Cavalcade was one of the most technically ambitious shows ever staged in this country. It had three acts and 22 scenes, one of which, a love scene, was written as lightly as the balcony scene from Private Lives. It's 1912, and Edward Marriott and his bride are on the deck of a ship on their honeymoon. But at the end of this apparently light-hearted scene, Coward created a moment of great dramatic theatre which stunned the first-night audience and was to become an infallible theatrical cliché, now also, of course, known to Hollywood. Edith picks up her cloak, which has been hanging over the rail, and they walk away. The lights dim to a blackout, save for one spot, which falls on the life belt her cloak has been covering. All that we see is the writing on that life belt, and the words read... SS Titanic. Cavalcade opened at Drury Lane in October 1931 and was greeted on the first night with tumultuous fervour. By the autumn of that year, it must have seemed to Noel that he'd reached a point in his career from which there was no place to go but gently downhill. Within the past 24 months, he had written, composed and directed Bittersweet, written and starred in Private Lives, written and directed Cavalcade. The only thing he now had to worry about was how to follow that. He went back to the impresario, Charles Cochrane, with the idea of yet one more review. This one, an all-black-and-white, low-key affair with no star names, and a concentration on the lyrics rather than the settings. The words would, of course, be cowards, as would the music and the production. Cochrane was understandably appalled, since this clearly was going to be Coward's 1932 review, whereas all the predecessors had remained Cochrane's. But Noel was not to be dismissed that easily. And so it was that words and music came into being. Music 
In that cast, admittedly in the back row for most of the numbers, was a young singer who later was to share much of Noel Coward's life and to star in many of his post-war shows. His name is Graham Payne, and this was his first professional engagement. Well, I got the audition, to audition for him, and my mother, who's a very shrewd lady, said there's not much call for boy sopranos in a Cochrane Coward review, uh, so you better sing and dance at the same time. So I did. I did a tap dance to Nero My God to Thee, sang it and danced it together. So <laughs> he thought that was rather funny. And so he engaged me. And I worked through words and music. I was asked to sing I Hear You Calling Me as the beggar boy before Mad About the Boy sequence. But they placed me over the brass section. And uh, I couldn't sing I Hear You Calling Me with the brass blaring out Mad About the Boy, so they had to cut it. And um, that was the end of the singing. I thought I was going to be fired. But I wasn't. I was kept on. Another of the stars of that show was Sir John Mills. Words and Music was a wonderful show to be in. And I think it contained some of the most brilliant lyrics that... Uh, that Sir Noel ever wrote. Uh, and at that time, I was, a, I was a song and dance man, and I did a number in it called um, Something to Do with Spring, the Joyce Barber. And just to show how the censorship has altered, there was one line, the last line in the lyric, which I remember went, I'd like to know what that stallion thinks. Maybe it's something to do with spring. And it was so utterly disgusting that we had to cut it out on the second night. Words and Music achieved a successful, if not wildly impressive, run of 164 performances at the Adelphi. And while it was still running there, Noel himself set off for America to direct and co-star with Alfred Lunt and Lynn Fontaine, two of his oldest friends, in a play he'd always promised he would write for all of them, Design for Living, the story of a trio of people who find it impossible to live together and equally impossible to live apart. Years later, Noel recalled it with some affection. We were old friends to start with, and when we were young together, many years ago, we planned that when we were all three uh, stars in our own right, that I would write a play for the three of us. And eight years later, it came true. And we did design for living, and to play with those two is quite, quite unlike anybody else. Quite, quite different. But, of course, we could um, experiment on stage, after we'd played for a few weeks or whatever, suddenly Lynn would decide maybe to play by the fireplace instead of by the window. And I would be delighted because it would give me a new approach. And then Alfred would come on and find us both in completely different places and not, wouldn't faze him at all. One night, by accident, Alfred said one of my lines and I gave him a quick look and replied with his line. And we, with one glint, it wasn't fooling on the stage. This was not yeah. jolly jokes. I wanted to do some of the bits of business that he'd put in, because I admired them. And the same with me. He wanted, he'd seen little bits that he fancied. We switched roles. It didn't matter psychologically, because we were both drunk. So we played the whole scene, reverse-wise, from different sides of the stage, playing each other's parts. Only at the very end, scene. There was a moment when I had to do rather a discreet little belch and I knew that Alfred couldn't do a belch. So we got to that moment and I was thinking all levels at once and thought, what am I to do? So I answered his line and said his afterwards quickly and got back and did my little belch and the curtain came down. And people were out in the front who'd seen the play before and never noticed the difference. Mm -hmm. 